The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became dazzling white, such as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Then a cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud there came a voice, This is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one with them anymore, but only Jesus. As they were coming down the mountain, he ordered them to tell no one about what they had seen until after the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Loving God, open our eyes to see your presence in our midst. Amen. Friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> As I will mention, often I listen to a podcast from our seminary, Luther Seminary in St. Paul. And on that podcast, every single year during the season of Lent, Dr. Rolf Jacobson, our Old Testament professor, who can be quite a hilarious person and interesting, uh, who can also go on rants. And one of his rants every single year this time is begging pastors not to use the phrase, the journey of Lent. He does not want us to say that. I was going to say he wants us to use a different metaphor, but I'm not sure about that. I do know he finds the phrase, the journey of Lent, annoying. And I've mentioned this before because I do suspect that Dr. Jacobson has a point. And what is that point? I don't want you to all say that his point is ministers are annoying. But I think there are all sorts of insights that one might gain from Dr. Jacobson's complaint about using the word journey for our observation of Lent. I think we use words like that because we would like to imagine that our lives have a sense to them, that different events are connected to each other, that we are headed somewhere and it will all make sense, even if it doesn't make sense right now. Of course, God is with you throughout the, um, uh, the time of our wandering, let's call it. He is suggesting, I think in part, that the word journey might well presume too much. It might alienate some who are sure that they are lost with nowhere to go, those for whom the bumps in the road have totally derailed their lives. And I think he suspects that we talk too glibly sometimes, as if we have it all together and that we know more than we, than we possibly can about where it is that we are actually going. I think of all of this for numerous reasons. We have Ash Wednesday this week, services at noon and at seven, right? We have set aside the 40 days that follow as a time to attending, a time for attending to Jesus Christ, walking with him to the cross and to the Easter dawn, listening along the way. And so how we talk about this time might be important. Our vision of this time might help us to better listen to what God has to say to us through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ our Lord. And so I'm wondering if the word pilgrimage would be a good one for us in Lent. The pilgrimage of Lent. Our Lenten pilgrimage. I could make you sick of that pretty soon too. <laughs> we could be little Lutheran Lenten pilgrims. And you know, if you look at the 
dictionary, you'll find that basically pilgrimage is a synonym for journey. But I think pilgrimage, that word and concept might better communicate a bit of the sense of what the season of Lent can have in store for us. A pilgrim, a pilgrim returns from their travels transformed and inspired to live each day in fresh ways. While a pilgrim has a definite goal, a definite place that they are uh, going, they are also seeking an unknown transformation in their travels. Well, each year, the Sunday before Lent, we hear this story, the story of Jesus' transfiguration. And it's a wonderful text for leaning into Lent. It's a story filled with meaning and symbols and insights, yet like a pilgrimage, it's not easily explained or readily broken down into one clear understanding of what has gone on. Now, I haven't mentioned Will Willimon in at least two weeks, I think, so I'll bring him into the conversation. He tells a story of talking of a, of a conversation someone had with a novelist I only sort of remember Willimon's story, so I'm kind of making this up, but we'll say it's from Willimon. Well, this author had written a story uh, with a very interesting character as the main character. And late in the story, after you've gotten to know this person, the person is involved with a conflict and, and he or she kills someone. Well, this person in this conversation with the novelist said, I couldn't believe it. When the main character killed that guy, I was so surprised. And the novelist replied, I was surprised too. I am surprised that this sermon has become a bit of a reflection on what it might mean to look at Lent in a different way. Well, if we were to embark on a Lenten pilgrimage, would that require that we add fasting and prayer? Pretty much throughout my time here, pretty much my time as a pastor, I have suggested not that we give something up for Lent, but that you consider adding something on to your life over these 40 days. Add prayer, add Bible study, add service, add Wednesday evening worship at 7 o'clock with Lent supper preceding at 6. Maybe add a daily devotion to your practice As I wrote in uh, the Connections this past week, one pastor said that this suggestion is a bunch of baloney. And not only did Pastor Smith hurt my feelings with that, um, she also made me think. There are all sorts of reasons that throughout our history, Christians have regularly practiced the religious discipline of fasting. Fasting is a wise and good thing for us to practice. There are plenty of things, if you think about it, that it would be wise for you and me to give up. There would be much to be gained for many of us in exercising self-denial. When we set aside fasting, we lose more than we realize. This is my son, The beloved, listen to him. Here is something to consider. Whether we are adding something to our daily lives or if we are working at the discipline of fasting this Lent, might the addition be something about sitting in Christ's presence? Might we be wise to deny ourselves some of the distractions that keep us from listening closely and clearly at God's call to live in grace and forgiveness and love. Will Willimon, whom I haven't mentioned in three minutes, he taught preaching at Duke Divinity School. And he tells a story of two students having a conversation. One is Catholic and one is Baptist. And they're having a disagreement about some significant theological insight and uh, they kind of came to a impasse 
Well, I guess we'll have to agree, the Baptist fellow said. You are Catholic, and that works for you. I'm Baptist, and that works for me. And the Catholic guy replied, You don't know much about being Catholic, do you? (laughs) It doesn't work for me. It works on me. There's something wonderful about the story of the transfiguration. It seems so strange and, and glorious, filled with meaning, and much of it very hard to explain or perhaps even uh, uh, understand or maybe even impossible to understand, to explain. Jesus is transfigured, turns dazzling white, visited by Moses and Elijah, and they talk. Wouldn't you think Mark would tell us something that they said? Then they're gone. And we see only Jesus. It's a little bit like life. There's not really easily understandable things going on here. It's not really something we can explain. It's so open for each and every person here. Why does it happen like that? What does it mean? What are you to do as you hear uh, this story? You see, I think this story invites you to a pilgrimage, to walk with this dazzling one who dazzles with God's love for all the world. Listen to him. And what follows is this teaching. Don't talk about this till after Easter. And that is where we all are invited on our pilgrimage with Jesus to suffering and the cross, to the resurrection to the strange and wondrous place of God's revelation of forgiveness and love and hope and resurrection life, a dazzling glory that is hidden in the cross of Christ, a dazzling glory that is lived out by you and me and all of God's people everywhere as each of us continues on our journey. Amen.